Hello once again, you beautiful nerds. I am Wildfire One. You guys are both watching and listening Nerds New Sexy Entertainment, the podcast. Uh, thanks again for joining us. With me today is... Hi, Clovis Dye here, longtime fan of Mod Modest Medusa. Yep, and we'll be talking about... Uh, we got two very special guests. We're going to be talking about Yeld and Modest Medusa. Uh, please introduce yourselves. Well, hi, my name's Jake. Um, I'm the creator of Modest Medusa and the co-creator of The Magical Land of Yeld. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and I'm super happy to be here. And uh, my name's Nick. I am the other co-creator of Magical Land of Yeld, also from Portland. Crazy, right? And uh, yeah, yeah, excited to, to, to talk about it. Oh, I was going to say we're actually brothers. Oh, yeah. uh, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> Let me start this off with thanking you guys for being here. It's an honor to have you here. It's a very, uh, we got to play the game in the beta version. Uh, Clovis actually introduced me to it, and I just fell in love with it. It's it. I can't wait to play more. Uh, you guys are getting my money when I get the when I'm able to buy the the books and stuff. I guarantee it. Uh, Thanks. So Clovis, uh, do you want to do you want to tell a little bit of the story of how you kind of met these guys and go from there? Okay, sure. Back sometime around 2008 or maybe it was 2009, I found this series of web comics on DeviantArt, and I just happened to discover them around the time they were running the Kickstarter for the printing of the first book, Modest Medusa Volume 1. I think coincidentally the only time they published a book on Kickstarter and something didn't go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that first one was surprisingly smooth. But while, after I got their first book, I noticed he had this thing called Mermaid Hunters, a test module for an RPG. I'm like, ooh, I'm going to look at this too for his RPG that was supposed to just be out any time now. <laughs> it wasn't. Oh, my God. So we had actually been working on uh, The Magical Andy Yelled for several years at that point. Mm -hmm. And I think, I'm not sure exactly when we started, but it might have been as early as 2006. I think that's uh, and we Yeah, and we thought that the game was going to be out any time. Like, each time we would uh, compile all the rules, we thought, this is it. Uh, we'll play test a little more, and then the game will be out, you know, in six months. And we went through long breaks where, you know, we lost interest in designing games. I started working on Modest Medusa and I was focusing on my comic. Uh, other stuff happened. And it just kind of kept getting pushed off and pushed off and pushed off until finally, did we launch the Kickstarter for Yeld in, what year I think was, it was that? I think it was 2015. Yeah, oh, it was geez, 2015. That was so long ago. <laughs> like, the, the game just officially came out this year, so I... That's such a long time. I mean, Nick, it's been half your life. That's true. It has been about <laughs> half. <laughs> and I'm glad it's finally here. It's a great game. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Modest Medusa. Uh, when did that start? Okay. Um, let me let me pull a book off the shelf here to check the uh, copyright date in it. For sure. Because I don't actually remember what year. All right. So yeah, the first Modest book Medusa a... is uh, Jake's baby. Uh, nah. He'd been working on that for yeah, a the... while before he invited me in to sort of uh, collaborate on the RPG. Hmm. Well, it's always right. it's always good to have help. That's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I think I started the book in t the uh, comic in 2011. Mm. I'm not entirely sure about that, uh, but that sounds right to me. So it's been it'll be nine years on New Year's uh, Eve. Okay. Uh, it's a it was a project that was born out of frustration. I didn't plan on starting a comic. I was working on some other game stuff, and it wasn't going well. And I came back from a convention that I was at with uh, Nick and a few friends, and I found that my toilet had flooded. In my, that the, the bathroom connected to my bedroom, and the toilet had flooded and just spewed disgusting piss water all over my bedroom and like destroyed like all my belongings origin story and yeah and this this was on new year's eve Ooh. and i was i was a little bit drunk and i was angry and instead of dealing with it i just stormed out of the house and i was renting a studio space um where i could work which is actually where i'm sitting right now ah. and so i came here and i had some more to drink and i was angry so i decided i would draw this like rage comic about my toilet flooding and it was going to be like this rant about you know, how the world is awful and how everything is crapping on me. But, like, after the first page, I couldn't really sustain my anger. So instead, I stuck this cute Medusa in it. Huh. And 
I posted the pages on uh, Facebook that day mm -hmm. or, you know, on, on New Year's Day and people liked it. So I did a few more and then I did a few more and a week later I had done like 10 of them and I thought, you know, I think I'm going to keep doing this. Did you come up with a and name so, like out of nowhere or did it take a little bit? Before you came up? No, completely out of nowhere. It just formed out of nothing. Oh, wow. There was there was absolutely no intent for it to be an ongoing thing. And even at the time, I thought maybe I'll do this for like a week or two and then I'll just give up and move on to other things. But, you know, my friends liked it and it slowly started to get an audience. And after six months, I had done almost 100 strips and I thought maybe I could do a book. And you and shared by your point, love of chocodiles with everyone. <laughs> right. See, I had actually never had a chocodile until um, that day. Yeah, for those who don't know, because uh, a lot of people think chocodiles aren't a real thing or they never heard of them. They're a hostess treat like uh, Twinkies or um, Ding Dongs. Mm -hmm. And basically what they are is they're a chocolate-covered Twinkie. Uh, the game store that's right across the street from me at work here, uh, the guy that works there brought in a box of them. And I tried one on New Year's Day, and I liked it, so I, stu I put it in my comic. And it's become a staple of the comic ever since then. But Nick and I had already been working on Yeld at that point. And early on in Modest so Medusa, a, I, a few years? Yeah, and I decided uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted the two projects to be connected. I wanted to be able to bring in Yeld stuff into Modest Medusa, uh, like, you know, the prince and um, her, you know, the, she comes from the magical land and then they go back there and have adventures. I wanted that to be part of the comic. Okay, that's, that's, that's actually really cool. Um, it sounds like Yeld came first. Yeah, yeah, Yell definitely came first, and I, I feel like uh, Jake was working on that a couple years before I sort of joined in, and it was definitely, I mean, I'm sure Jake can tell it better, but it's certainly a, uh, you know, a, a love letter to a lot of the uh, fantasy and sci-fi stuff we grew up with, mm -hmm. uh, video games, comics, movies, all of that. Oh yeah, um, and just the just the genre of sort of like through the looking glass games stories. like uh, Secret Amanda, yeah, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, games like that. Uh... Or games like that and stories like that. Anime like Inuyasha, which is all about, you know, falling through a magical well and coming out in this world that's mm -hmm. different and you can be a hero and explore. That's always been very powerful to me. It's really raw escapism. Oh, yeah. And that, I think that's that's the whole idea behind gaming in general is escapism. Yeah. Originally, um, a friend of a friend of mine named uh, Vincent Baker had uh, published a game called Dogs in the Vineyard. Mm -hmm. And I got a hold of a copy of that, and it's, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but it's this tiny little game, it's only, it originally was only about 80 pages, and it comes in just this tiny little booklet, and I really liked that it was a small, self-contained role-playing game that was about one thing, hmm. so I thought, um, I wanted to do something like that, I wanted it to do with this tiny little game where you just play children. Uh, who discover a magical land. That seemed like a fun idea to me. Yeah. And the original idea is it would just be like a 50-page booklet. Uh, it would just have like a few illustrations and it would be printed very cheaply and I could like, you know, hand it out to friends and stuff like that. Not one part of that came true. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I, something that Nick and I do is when we start working on something, it expands exponentially. Like Nick yeah. creates stuff, I create stuff, and then we try to jam it together. For the record, people, there's tons of pages, there's tons of pictures, and it's printed very nicely. Mm -hmm. It's Oh, well, thanks. Uh, oh, well, I, I was going to say somewhere <laughs> along the way that uh, we wanted Yell to be this big, fancy, like, art book kind of thing. And we wanted to really lean on uh, comics and other visual storytelling to set the world and to show people what we were doing. Okay. Nick, it sounded like you were going to chime in. What were you going to say? I was. Uh, well, what I was going to say was um, during that time, during the, the years we were working on Yeld, and again, yeah, like he was saying, it kind of started as this idea of being something small, but over the years of working on it, we actually put out a bunch of other smaller games, and so that probably really scratched the itch for us, mm, uh, creating that's you know, smaller story games of different genres. Uh, so when we finally did get down to Yeld, it became this massive, you know, we want to make this huge role-playing game. Yeah, we really did a 180 on that. Um, we released uh, C. Dracula and Classroom Deathmatch together, and Nick did the Tulip Academy uh, Society for Dangerous Gentlemen, and I did some other games too. And those were our small, compact games. And after that, we wanted Yeld to just be this bigger thing, this living thing. Um, we, I think we often use World of Warcraft as a template for it. Okay. Where we want to 
we want to introduce the game and then we constantly want to be adding more things to it so you can come back and live in the world and try new things. Would you say the other games that you created were a good stepping stone in learning more to make Yield the game it is today? Oh, definitely. I mean, everything has been, you know, a trial and error. I know certainly like uh, working on some of the early stuff like we did with Classroom Deathmatch, which was our um, like homage to like uh, Battle Royale. Okay. And um, like, you know, some of the stuff we figured out with that, I know for me, a lot of that was learning how to actually like technically write, you know, write things that people can actually understand, sort of figuring out how you need to explain rules in a way that makes it really easy to pick up. Um, especially for yeah. these smaller games, you want people to be able to pick these things up, you know, right in that first session, because you're usually only playing, you know, a one-off session for these small things. So well, I'll be honest, half the time I can't understand what I'm reading in a, in the Pathfinder manual. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> yeah, I am I am very bad at being able to read um, games text. Like, mm -hmm. I, I'll just sit in front of a book and zone out. Uh, and our solution to that was to both have a conversational tone in, in the game where it kind of feels like we're t telling you how to play in person instead of it being a dry textbook, but also including awesome. comics that show you the rules and show you how to play. And we felt like that was really important. That's very I awesome. I like that touch. The, uh, one of the big dynamics that, that I found was really awesome that I've never seen in any other games uh, of this nature was the, the, the rotating DM idea. What, what gave you guys that idea? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, that feels like it was born out of necessity to keep our one friend from running all the games over and over again. We're just sharing yeah. the burden, you know, because it can really feel that way sometimes when you have one person who basically tells all the stories all the time. Um, and it just—I don't know—it feels unfair. And I also feel like players are made better when they have to GM, right? If you have yeah. to step into those shoes, you all of a sudden become a better player. You understand what they have to put up with. I get it completely. And it, well, it, and it spurs your creativity. Um, there's kind of two sides to it. When we started playing and testing the game, as Nick said, we had one friend who was like, I'm going to make this story the kind of story I want it to be. Mm -hmm. And that was frustrating for the rest of us because we wanted it to be something else. So um, we decided that the way to circumvent that was that everybody would take turns and we would build a story together. And that kind of became a core tenet of Yell that our that our adventure is a story we tell as a group, and that it's stronger because of that. All the aspects I mean, of this game is just it's ingenious. Let me, you guys deserve a golf clap because there's a, I, when I played it, I just fell in love with it. Well, I appreciate that. I feel like um, it also certainly helps when you have sort of what is essentially like an episodic nature to the game. Yes. Um, if you treat it like it's something like Avatar: The Last Airbender. You have these core episodes about fighting these big, you know, seven hunters to get home. But then you have a lot of, like, the fun stuff, like mm -hmm. uh, go to town and eat some pie, uh, go talk to some ghosts and make some friends. And I feel like the nature of switching GMs back and forth makes that really easy. Well, um, at the same time, you're playing, you're playing youngsters, too, which is great because you you you're bringing out your inner child. Totally, totally. And that's certainly something that I feel I think like that's people that's can really buy into when they play. I think that's really important too. Uh, we needed to be able to sell this world where sometimes you can be super serious and the stakes are life and death and you're saving a kingdom and you're growing up and becoming uh, a better and stronger or sometimes a more evil person. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, sometimes it's like a Pokemon game where you're doing goofy kid stuff. And we needed, um, we needed players to be able to accept that and, and playing kids gives you an elasticity where you can go back and forth between do things where you can be very serious and very intense but also you can have a lot of fun and be goofy and have adventures like that well some of the best uh stories told were through the eyes of children I, exactly I so. it's, it's incredible you guys you guys tapped into something that's really amazing in my opinion you know, and well, we thanks. get, like, some really good reactions from people when we go to cons, and, like, we see those people who, like, they immediately see the art, and then they read, you know, the introduction comic, and it clicks, right? There's clearly some level that we're hitting for a lot of people who are like, yes, this is the kind of stuff, this is the young adult stories that I really love, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's always great to see that. And it's even better when you get actual kids who want to sit down at the table and play. Oh, yeah. Uh, because it, it speaks to them in a way that something like Dungeons & Dragons might not necessarily speak to them. Uh, like, for example, we, we see a lot of kids at conventions especially who want to play Dungeons & Dragons, but they can't quite wrap their head around it. 
or they are playing and they have figured out how to play, but um, they're playing adults and that, mm. that can be fun, that can be fun for them. But a lot of those kids really respond to the chance to play somebody their own age. Do you guys have any interesting stories from your playthroughs or your test plays of the game? Uh, yeah, <laughs> the hard question. Think, I, I, that's the thing we've been <laughs> we've we've had so many different play tests over the years, right? Like we've we've had so many you know chances where we're just like, okay, this is the one you know we'll play test it for you know uh, ten or twelve games to see how it's working, and then after that, of course, we do a bunch of changes, so we have to do another play test after that. I think really a lot of it is, you know, how people approach the rules. Um, there are a lot of people who immediately see some of the sillier or more uh, team-oriented mechanics of the game. Mm -hmm. And people get really into doing ridiculous things with uh, the action chain mechanics, which is all about, you know, uh, I go after you and we get bonuses because we're supporting each other. Um, and there's always, like... There's, there's always a group of players who, who have, like, mapped out how these actions are going to play out. And who have, you know, created these elaborate plans for, you know, assembling the greatest action chain for the mage to cast the most amazing spell. And then, of course, you ruin that uh, as <laughs> the GM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's as simple as using a, a, a special die called Excuse Me, mm -hmm. which is a whole mechanic built around the idea of interrupting players before they can act. Which, uh, that's another that dynamic is... that's amazing, by the way. Always well, a lot of fun. I... <laughs> One thing I'd like to say, I know the game's about kids, but I'm glad you left the dog in as a playable character. I know originally it was only supposed to be in the test module. Yeah, it was, I think of the dog as a late idea, but it's, I guess it's actually been around for years and years and years. Um, unfortunately, I think you can kind of look at the game if you look through the book and see that the dog was kind of added after everything else. Uh, there's not a lot of stuff that really supports the dog as much as some of the other um, parts of the game. But it's it's a fun idea. I, I really like playing the dog, and it's certainly something that we we've, we've talked about. Like like we always have these ideas of like, oh, here's like a cool crossbow that you can mount on the da back of the dog, or you know, here's a neat <laughs> sword that he can grip in his mouth. So like we have this collection of ideas that will slowly make the dog you know uh, have its own set of mechanics, uh, making it a little more you know unique to play. Dog two point yeah. yeah yeah well, and our and our plan with Yeld is to constantly be releasing new stuff for it. Uh, new things that are easy to plug into your game. Uh, for example, early next year, we're going to be releasing a module that we are, I think, calling uh, Season of the Tea Master, okay. which is a big holiday event uh, where you go and you visit this Tea Master who travels around Yeld, and you have to do things for him to unlock the tea recipes he has. But he's also a prisoner. He's a prisoner of the prince who's forced to tour around Yeld and sell tea. And so you can uh, challenge his bodyguards and try to free him um, and then he'll allow you to uh, learn new, like, tea-based skills at you, your job as well. Uh, so we, we like the idea of introducing small things that are easy to plug in and that uh, you can use in your adventures or once or twice, or they can become, like, a main part of your game. Okay. That's that's very interesting. So the uh, one of the questions that's been, been going through my mind throughout this whole interview so far is, is this. Where did the Mermaid Hunters originate from like what made you go okay well this beta is or the first game is going to be about hunting mermaids i know we had i had the mermaid characters in modest medusa uh jenny and deb were characters who showed up very early in the comic and they were popular mm. and it may have been just as simple that i wanted a hook to bring modest medusa readers into the role-playing game you know, because originally okay. in the first version of the game, the mermaids you were hunting were those two characters. Um, and in the newer version of Mermaid Hunters, which we've designed as a starter set for the Magical Land of Yeld, it's a completely different set of mermaids. And they are they are criminals who are terrorizing the land, but they have like a sympathetic backstory. OK, um, I also think I was just having fun drawing mermaids. It was a like, phase. <laughs> it, really, it was a phase I have not grown out of. A lot of the stuff we do doesn't really have a bigger reason behind it. Very often it's just because, you know, we saw something cool and we thought, let's stick that in the game. Yeah, so much of it is just style and aesthetics a lot of the time. Yeah. I, the, the more we can define what the world looks, sounds, and feels like, I feel like the better, you know, chance players are going to be able to grip onto it. Mm -hmm. Oh, what I was going to say before is one of the things we did learn as we were playtesting is that and, and we knew this, of course, already, but uh, role-playing game players have a lot of preconceived notions about what a role-playing game is. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that comes from whatever games you've played before. If you've played a lot of Traveler or a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, then you're going to approach every game like those games. Uh, whereas if you've played like a lot of GURPS, you're going to approach a game like GURPS. And because of that, we would sit down to play Yeld with people, and they would immediately resist some of the ideas. Like the rotating game master, they would resist that. Or the idea that you were playing kids, they would totally resist that. Uh, a lot of players initially didn't like the idea of the calendar or that uh, time moves throughout the game as you travel and you have to keep track of that or that you get older or that you eventually turn into monsters. So yeah. one of the challenges with the game was uh, making, uh, designing it so that these are things that seemed exciting and that you wanted to try as opposed to things that got in your way and didn't feel like the kind of role-playing game you wanted to play. Um, I think a good example of that is, yeah, originally we had this collection of mechanics referred to as chores. Um, and we had this whole idea of like, oh, you know, one person needs to uh, cover this and one person needs to cover that. And very immediately people resisted that um, hmm. as this concept of like, oh, this sounds like work, right? Um, yeah. And those are still things that are in the game. Like one of the chores yeah. was somebody's in charge of the calendar and they keep track of every day we're in Yeld and they keep track of like when the holidays are coming and the birthdays are coming. And another character take, keeps track of the map and, and notes where we've been. And another character like records every monster we meet and records their name and what they do. Um, and eventually uh, we had to put those uh, more as part of the uh, natural part of the game instead of assigning them to different players because it, it did feel like work and people pushed back against that a lot. Uh, yeah, I could, I could see that I could see. as being something that would feel like work. But I mean, it also I also see it as a good thing because you've got to record who you've, you've talked to and whatever or you'll forget. You, yes, you, you, and you, I also think it's just the presentation of it, right? To, to to refer to it as a chore, I think immediately clicked in people's brains as like that childish part of your brain that goes, I don't want to do my chores. This <laughs> is the worst, right? I would rather be, mm -hmm. you know, doing something else. Well, at least you didn't um, call it homework. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think we did consider that at one point. <laughs> oh, yeah. there, is, there is a natural part of uh, the brain for a lot of role players where they, uh, they pick up a new game and they naturally start saying, what parts of this can I cut out? What parts of this am I not going to use? And uh, that's really interesting. It's really interesting that um, if you play role-playing games, chances are you kind of consider yourself to be a game designer to some extent. You do a lot of modding, you do a lot of hacking, uh, you write your own adventures. Uh, and I think that's really natural for people. So when you have a new game that's not just a game that you want people to try once or twice, but you actually want them to play for like 10 sessions or 20 sessions or like two or three years, uh, you really have to think about you know, how are we going to make this appealing and how are we going to make them accept everything we're doing instead of just hacking it up and using it to play um, D&D. That totally makes sense. And I, I, I'll put it this way. It's definitely not a D&D &D game. It is definitely a tabletop game that's really amazing. And because, uh, you know, uh, everyone everyone out there that doesn't know much about other tabletop games other than D&D &D are always going to be like, oh, is this like D&D? &D? Yeah, of course. Naturally. And inevitably, that's how we introduce it to a lot of people that we're, we know aren't going to be familiar. Um, yeah. <laughs> to just throw in that line of, you know, if you're familiar with D&D, &D, at least you got a foot in the door and it's a little bit easier to explain, you know. Yeah. It's like D&D, &D, but it's not. <laughs> yeah. We, we spend a lot of time taking the game to comic book conventions and anime shows. And so often... Uh, we'll be sitting at our booth with this book and people will come up and they'll be interested but they won't know what it is and we'll say it's it's a role playing game they'll be like great so this is this the instruction manual and we'll be like yes and they'll say how do i play it and we'll start to describe it and they'll nod and they'll nod and they'll say so is it for xbox <laughs> <laughs> And it's easier now that things like Critical Role exist. It's easier that D&D is having this revolution now where people are more familiar with it. But still, every game, every show we go to, there's several people where we have to explain the nature of it. And it's it's a very hard hurdle to get over. Well, here's, here's a question. Are you guys thinking maybe in the future to do a game for a console or even Steam? I, working on a, a video game is actually something we've been doing off and on for, God, I mean, that's even been 10 years um yeah just talking with, with different small studios and having you know a few uh interesting conversations with people in the industry um but it's something we've talked about forever we have a uh, small local studio here in the pacific northwest who we've had several conversations with and they are i i think it's safe to say that they are technically the person who the, the group who owns the license for yelled at the moment uh but okay. they've had s several setbacks 
and haven't really been able to move forward on it. Seems to be the the issues with uh, actual video games. There's always a setback. There's always something. You yeah. Know? yeah. If you I guys need so voice actors, fun. wink, wink. Me and Clovis, wink, <laughs> wink. <laughs> Man, I mean, the idea of making a game with voice actors, that's even a step up from what I thought we would do. <laughs> oh. You know? oh, my God, yeah. No, I think our original ideas was something like... Um, an RPG maker kind of thing. Oh, okay. Uh, we, we've talked about doing a visual novel kind of thing before, mm-hmm. which feels like something we might be able to accomplish on our own. Oh yeah. Our, our, our entire enterprise is just Nick and myself. Uh, we, we make yelled. I make my comic. We make a bunch of merchandise. We tour it around and do conventions. We do podcasts. Uh, so we're, we're very, very busy. And every time we add one more project on top of that, well, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why yelled took years and years to get out to begin with. Oh yeah. So we have to be very careful in budgeting our time. Clovis, do you have any any uh, stories from our game that you want to tell them? Ooh. Oh, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Okay, let me think about which one I want to tell. <laughs> well, there is. I think we played what we we did maybe about six, seven games. <laughs> yes. Wow. At one point, we ran into a village of sentient frog rocker British pigs. Oh, oh yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, each one of them had that a different. Sounds amazing. Each one of them had a different rocker persona, right? <laughs> yeah, one was Elvis, one was Ozzy, you know, so on, and so on. Well, see, that's perfect. That definitely belongs in Yell. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a really cool story. Uh, we and it, it's it, 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 like as we went on, it each one each one of us did got to GM, and it was really fun. I I enjoyed. It was a really good experience for me too. You did a love right. story between a, a a ferret and a pug. Yes, I did a I did a <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. This was what they asked me to do, a Romeo and Juliet story between a ferret and a pug. That's awesome. And if they would have went a certain direction, they'd have met Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> oh wow, that's yeah. great. Or yelled did, version well. of Scrooge McDuck. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> Don't sue us, Disney. <laughs> But, uh, uh, one of the things I really love doing in our Yelt games, um, any, anytime I get to run a game, is I love uh, introducing the idea that there's things from our world that have fallen through to Yelt. Uh, so in one of the early games I ran, uh, the, the kids uh, went to a goblin fortress, and what they found was that the goblins had found these old film projectors, and they were watching, like, Seven Samurai <laughs> and um, <laughs> Fortress and all these old Kurosawa films, and that was kind of informing their culture. And that that was a lot of fun. I love weird stuff like that. We had so they were samurai ones. goblins. <laughs> yeah, they were kind of samurai-ish goblins. <laughs> I kind of remember there being uh, a game very early on that Jake ran, where the idea was that there was like a dragon in a cave, and we had to go fight it. Oh. And we get there, and it wasn't in fact a dragon. It was like a soldier from World War One with a flamethrower who got lost. <laughs> Awesome. That's badass. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, stuff like that is a ton of fun. And a lot of that stuff, a lot of stuff from our early games, of course, um, ended up informing uh, the fiction of Yeld. Like uh, the fairies of Yeld were something that one of our players introduced into the game, and we just liked it. Uh, the teddy bear the, warriors. Oh yeah. Yeah, with the idea that they were um, they were actually just orcs at the time, but they were called fairies because they had like invaded the fairy lands and eaten all the fairies, and then that's just where they were from now. <laughs> um, and we liked that idea and we just ran with it um, other ideas like the, the character of the Prince Dragul kind of evolved through our games uh, from this just kind of uh, you know kind of generic vampire guy to being kind of the smooth uh, sexy super villain that he is yeah I, I think of him as kind of a cross between um, David Bowie and James Bond and Batman and Prince oh oh, you just said like, you said like the names that I love Sure. So it's cool. Sure. David Bowie in Labyrinth was the best villain. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and 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 the prince uh, wears a cod piece specifically because of that. There was there was an earlier version of the game. You, you you guys might remember this, where one of the special dice that monsters could have was called sexy. And if they had sexy, and you were over the age of like uh, thirteen, 13. Yeah. you um you would uh roll less dice against them because you were confused by their sexiness it's like a charm i think that was in the mod it, it was in the mod okay. that we had it was in the mod i think i think one of our players had that issue where like 
they wouldn't attack that specific uh, monster. I mean, we yeah, we, we like had... the idea that as you get older, uh, you know, you're more complicated by these, you know, thoughts and urges. But also, eventually, we took that out. Yeah, I think we replaced it with. Uh, I don't remember the mechanic. It, basically, there was a two-sided mechanic. One of them was sexy. You turn into a monster was, when you get older. Uh, yeah, the mm-hmm. other one was scary. Uh, yeah. The idea yeah. being that if you were younger than 13, it was harder to hit something because it was so scary. So it was like you're charmed or feared. Charmed. That I like that. Yeah. And we yeah. sort of adjusted those mechanics. I feel like they still exist. I just don't remember what we named them. Uh, uh, they totally exist, or they've evolved into something else anyway. Yeah. That happens so much. I got a question. Okay. Um, by the way, you mentioned how you're juggling all these projects and whatnot. Any um, information for the listeners at home as to when you might be running the Kickstarter for the next volume of Modest Medusa? Yes. Uh, thanks for asking. So um, I won't go into the huge number of reasons why that's been delayed for so long. But I am very much hoping to launch the Kickstarter for Modest Medusa season uh, five, six. Jeez, I don't even remember which one it is. <laughs> uh, the next book uh, at the end of January. Awesome. So in, a, in about a month. And I'm hoping to have a really fast turnaround on that. Uh, one of the reasons it's been delayed is because my printer went out of business and yes. so did my second printer. So I've been looking around for a new printer to use. But I Oof. think I finally settled on one. So, uh, you know, stuff like that complicates everything, and it, it, it brings uh, momentum just grinding to a halt. Oh, yeah. Like, my original plan for Modest Medusa was to do a book every year, but I've only done five books so far, and I've been at it for nine years. Well, sometimes uh, the best but, things in life are worth waiting for. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, there, so, yeah, there'll be a new Modest Medusa book uh, out uh, hopefully uh, before summer, and we'll be doing the Kickstarter for that early next year. Okay. Awesome. Good to hear. Okay, well, uh, you guys want to do some advertising? Well, let me uh, let me first say uh, The Magic Land of Yeld is a nice, big, fat, uh, physical, softcover book. It's, um, I think, very nicely printed. Uh, it's full color, about 260 pages. <laughs> Uh, we normally sell it for uh, forty-five dollars. It's on sale on our website right now for less than that as part of our holiday sale, and that goes through the end of the year. Uh, we also offer so digital wonderful. versions as well. Uh, we have uh, several different um, digital products, including our Mermaid Hunter starter set, which is designed to be an easy way to start the game. It's a five-dollar product, uh, and it guides you through your first several adventures in Yeld and, and teaches you how to play the game, gives you all the rules you need uh, to really get started as well as a bunch of printable resources like paper monsters and an action board and stuff like that. Uh, we Our plan for next year is to start releasing a series of smaller digital supplements. Our first one will be a guide to our Black Mage job, and these will be uh, smaller products that will be available through our website and drive through RPG and other sources as well for $5 each. That's, uh, that's my pitch. Do you want to add anything to that? No, I think you got it all. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, Clovis, is there anything you want to add in? No, I've cast everything I, me- I meant to, but I'm glad you guys could be here. Yeah, it was really great talking to you guys. Yeah, thanks for arranging this. Well, if you guys want, we'll do another one maybe down the line. Heck, maybe we'll even play a game. Oh, that'd yeah, be that'd awesome. be great. And in the meantime, I'm really eager to uh, check out the game you guys are running on uh, Christmas Eve. Oh, I'm... I warn yeah. you, it's the, an- <laughs> it's the ancient Mermaid Hunters, not the new one. Oh, no, totally. I would love. I would That's just. I, that sounds super nostalgic. You guys have a website or anything you guys want to talk about before we go? Yeah, um, you can learn everything about Yeld at yeldstuff.com. Uh, that's Y-E-L-D-S-T-U-F-F. And then you can read Modest Medusa at modestmedusa.com. And you guys that's do right. have a, a page on uh, Facebook, I believe, right? We oh, do, yes. We, have, we also have a Discord. And we'd invite people to check us out there. Uh, you can talk to us directly as well as other players. And we have a nice little community there. For sure. Again, guys, I appreciate you being here. You guys are amazing. Your your game ideas are great. I uh, can't wait to play more and show the world more about the magical land of Yelp. Thanks for having us. so much. All right, guys. um, This is the end of the podcast. We thank you guys for listening and watching. We'll be playing Mermaid Hunters for the magical land of Yeld on the 24th. It'll be a live event. Fingers crossed that goes well as far as, you know, technology working and everything. Uh, We appreciate you guys being here. We'll see you next time. We want you to stay nerdy. Stay sexy. Always. Always.